and can't see. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good, Good to be back in chapel after being out for, for a few weeks here. Uh, I want to start out by uh, seeing if we have any visitors today who are here for the first time. If you're here visiting our chapel this morning for the very first time, we ask that you please stand. Tell us who you are, where you come from, and we'll pass the mic to you. Microphone. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to be close to me here a little bit here. So, Major Boyles, um, I just transferred from Fort Campbell. I was the 61st medical detachment commander, and now I work over at the hospital. Okay. Glad you're here. Okay, it's good to have everybody back in chapel today. Um, a couple of notes, this is truly been a momentous uh, week. Uh, today we want to uh, give thanks to the Lord for the 70 year reign of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. You know, during her time as uh, a royal in, uh, in Great Britain, Great Britain and the Kingdom of Great Britain has become very and remained very staunch allies of the United States. And I would ask you to continue to pray for her son, King Charles III, um, keeping in mind that, you know, Great Britain and their soldiers of that empire have served alongside our soldiers for decades, since the first couple of world wars and even beyond that. Taken from someone who, on my second tour to Iraq, my boss was a brigadier from Australia, my deputy commander was a lieutenant general from the Kingdom of Great Britain. So we pray, continue to pray for the people of, of, of Great Britain. Of course, today, as everybody knows, is the uh, 21st anniversary of the attacks of 9-11. You should continue to pray for and remember those who died, not just in those attacks, but in the subsequent wars spun by those attacks. And we should continue to thank those who served and continue to serve, keeping in mind that the ideologies that spun those attacks off in the, that morning continue to be out there. ISIS came. Um, I'm Kata, even though our friend of from the Taliban said, no, no, they're not here. They're still out there on the scenes. Al Shabaab and Africa, keeping in mind that the price of security and peace for us is eternal vigilance by the young men and women of our armed forces. Continuing on, we will have fellowship today uh, in Chapel on Annex after service. There will also be a parish council meeting. Did not have that last Sunday, but we will have that. Uh, somewhere you need to fellowship over in the uh, chapel next after, after the fellowship. Uh, one, one quick little announcement I'd like to make, and we'll circle here for a second. The chapel directory. I just want to again uh, ask that everyone make sure that the information that we have for you in the chapel directory is correct. When it's email or phone number, that it, everybody is listed in there. You know, we have some people who may have arrived after we publish this. This chapel directory is more than just a phone roster where we get in contact with people, but it's also a, a method, a, a, a tool to help us keep track with the members of our chapel, uh, who's in, who's out, who's in the hospital, who's at home. Uh, and we use this to make sure that you know, we're able to engage, you know, carry messages, take care of the, the members of, of, the, of the congregation. And so again, we would ask uh, that you, you, know, if you don't have a copy, let us know, we'll get your copy. Check your information. Make sure that the information in, in, in the directory is correct and that we use this as a tool to help us all stay connected. Again, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, and with that, I think what I'll do now is I'll turn over the service to the chapel. I invite you now. Stand as we read those around you and pass the peace. Good morning. Good morning.
Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. The parable of the lost coin. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents.
Anybody else? Yes. Good morning, Chapman. Good morning. Good evening. Well, I found out I'm going to have to have a pacemaker put in tomorrow morning. Oh, no. I'm very grateful for the cardiologist came and put in. And then I'm very grateful. My daughter has to tell me it will be good to you. But she has to do all the driving for six weeks, and I'm not sure if she's going to pay me. So I'm going to go on.
and it seems like we can't land a job. It seems like we, we, we can't find a place to serve, to take care of our needs and the needs of ones we love. So, Lord, we are thankful uh, for employment. We thank you for the opportunity uh, that we have to serve you in, in jobs and careers. And thank you for the ability to do work and use our minds and our body and our strength. We thank you for the Macaulay's and their, their leadership here at this chapel service. And I ask that you would continue to keep them healthy and improve their health. And I know this has a, a, been a tough year for Chapel Macaulay and the loss of, of, of men, significant men in his life. And I just ask that you would be with him today. And Lord, as he has to travel to, um, to do other duties away from here, and uh, to speak at uh, college reunions and to be gone, I just ask that you would give him in, in traveling mercy. And continue to bless us as his chapel of gathered chaplains and religious affairs specialists and choir members and ushers and all of those, all of those who serve you in some capacity at this chapel service. So bless us. To do our best to serve you. Lord, I thank you um, for the children that come to our service each Sunday. We lift up their prayers as well. We lift up uh, this one, uh, Cousin Steffi, lost his mother. Lord, we thank you for marriages that succeed another year and another year. And how wonderful it is to hear of a, a marriage that's 14 years. Because those of, it, those of us that have been married a while, we, we know it's, it's not necessarily an easy thing. But you have to go through the tough times as well as the good times. And it says a lot about our commitment to each other. It says a lot about celebrating anniversary by sharing that with the body believers. We know that it's you, Lord, that helps us in our marriages and our relationship. We pray for those specifically who are fighting cancer. We also pray for that day when we find a cure for cancer. It affects those not only this morning in our Congregation, it affects those in our families, our extended families and loved ones. Indeed, in my own family, it has taken loved ones from me in the past. We pray for a cure for cancer. Pray for Teresa Baum, that you would work in her life. Thank you for, for her courage and her participation in reading scripture so many times. And we just ask that you would work specially in her life. And Lord, in all of our lives, when we are faced with temptation from the devil, from the evil one, to go astray, to do things to glorify ourselves and not you, we pray for the strength to stay on the right path. Lord, we thank you for John who is able to return to the choir. We thank you for those who have struggled with health and you brought them through and they returned to worship and returned to celebrate. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you. Lord, we pray for this one who will have surgery to remove lymph nodes. And I just pray for a successful surgery. And I pray that you be with the doctors, the nurses, the technicians, and guide them for a successful outcome. Lord, for all of us in here who struggle with some type of health, who have doctor's appointments right now on our calendars, Lord, I pray that you be with all the doctors, specialists that see us, and that you give us health. And when we receive that help, give us opportunities to continue to serve you. 
Lord, there are so many others that we can't begin to list all the prayers that come to mind. But we lift them up together to you. Lord, on this particular day, what a highlight. We pray for the United Kingdom, for the lost Queen Elizabeth, who most in this room, with all in this room, have grown up and hearing about and knowing about. And Lord, we pray for the transition of power. King Charles III. And Lord, we just, we ask for peace in this world. Lord, we remember in our own country, September 11th. And we not just remember those who lost their lives and the families that lost loved ones on that day. But we lift up those who have lost their lives in response to that day in the past 21 years. Lord, we also are grateful for the courageous men and women in this country and around the world who took a stand to do something about it rather than just grieve. They've been involved in local and national and international levels of service fighting tyranny, fighting terrorism, working for freedom for all people. And I ask that you would continue to keep them safe. Lord, we have deployed troops from Fort Bragg even today as we gather here in this same place to worship. We have troopers in harm's way today. And Lord, I especially ask that you would protect them this day. Protect their families. And Lord, I believe that you are the Prince of Peace that in the future, in your time, in your way, tyranny will be ultimately to be defeated. And no longer will there be a time when we have to take up arms against an enemy to stop tyranny. Because you, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, will come and put an end to that day. Or we look forward to that day. In the meantime, help us to continue to do our part so that all have free access to you. Keep us safe, Lord. Keep our nation safe. Keep our troops safe. Keep the families who support our troops safe as well. And bless them through long periods of separation. And Lord, we just thank you again for the opportunity to pray as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I invite you now to prepare to receive the offering.
ask that you would bless them, nurture them, expand them to serve all in our Fort Bragg community. In these things we ask your name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Verse 8. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, 
is not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God and one sinner who repents. Would you join me as we pray? Holy and precious Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. We thank you for the importance of this day. Not only is this a new day of life and a Lord's day in which we can come and worship their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, but also, Father, for the events of the world, for the events of the remembrance and opportunities even in this nation. Father, we are reminded again of how powerful and how great and how majestic you are. And so, Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your house on this important day. Father, draw us near to each other in fellowship. Help us to draw near to you in worship through the Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray that as we open with our hearts and minds the truth and the message that you would have us to receive from your word this morning, I pray that it would be understandable to us and that we could use it as we go out into the world this week. Father, draw us closer to you, we pray. Forgive us for many sins and all these things we ask in the holy and perfect name of Jesus Christ our Savior. God's people said, Amen. Amen. A few years ago, my wife's grandmother passed away, and it was kind of a sudden thing, and so uh, we were all saddened as we went to the funeral and after the burial. The family started talking about selling the house, the house only was about three or four down from where my, my wife's parents lived, which is on the same street. And so we went into the house, and the family got together, and they were going to sell the property, and so they went through all of Granny's things. And at that point, I'd never had to do that before. So I was in there helping my wife. And so basically, everything was in three piles as we went through everything that this woman had collected over her entire life. My father-in-law has a garbage business, so he brought one of the big dumpsters that he would rent out, and they put it right there on the front lawn. And as we went through the house, room to room, and down in the basement, and down in the garage, if there was anything that no one could use or no one wanted, it went right into the dumpster. And then there were things that she had in her home that, that people wanted. There were heirlooms, there were pictures. I can remember that my wife and I, we got back all the, the baby pictures of our kids that we had given Granny over the years. Of course, she's gone, she's not going to need them anymore, so, so we got those things back. And so people were doing that, going room to room in her house, looking for the things. You're, we're going to toss it out or we're going to keep it. Then there were some things that were really too good to throw away, but nobody really wanted them. Maybe they couldn't wear her clothes or, or some furniture that they didn't need, and so they, they donated those things. And so we were going to toss them, we were going to keep them, or we were going to donate them. And I can remember going through that and, and helping my wife with the emotional part of all of that. And if you've ever done something like that in your own life, you know there's, there's a lot there. You know, it doesn't, it's not just a job, and it's hard work moving furniture and throwing things away and sweeping and cleaning. It's hard work, but it's also emotional work as well. And so it was kind of hard on the family. And I can remember thinking, you know, one of these days, somebody's going to do this in my house. Somebody's going to go through all the collections and all the things and all the items that I thought were important. They're going to look in my closets and they're going to see the clothes that I had and they're going to get rid of my books or they're going to sell my guns or whatever it's going to be. Somebody's going to do the exact same thing one day for me we're doing right now for granted. And so I started thinking, well, why are we here? What is the purpose of all of this? All this life, 80 years, 85 years, 90 years of collecting clothes and dishes and furniture, what is the purpose of life? So I want you to mull on the question this morning as we look at our scripture. What am I doing here? I don't mean what are you doing here at Fort Bragg or what are you doing in Lane Post Chapel or whatever, you know, not even in Fayetteville, but what are you doing here? On God's earth. What's your purpose? What's my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing as I'm here for the limited time that I have on earth? What is their purpose this morning? So kind of mull on that. Kind of consider that. We'll come back to it later. As we look at our passage this morning in, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus, as I said, is, is telling three parables. And the first two is what we're going to look at this morning, the lost sheep and the lost coin. Now, Jesus, if you read the Gospels, he used parables quite a bit in his earthly teaching. And he did this because it was easy to understand, and there was a point to be presented or a point to be relayed. And so as he would tell stories, the attention of the crowd would be caught up, and it was easy to remember and easy to understand. Well, a lot of pastors use illustrations when they preach to, to get the point across. We do that as, as pastors sometimes when we preach. Something the 
somebody can remember. I've had people over the years that probably never remembered a point I made, but they'll still say, Brother Kent, remember that story that you told? I, I still remember that, you know? And so Jesus used parables, and the parables that we see in the New Testament, they always have a little hook. They always have a little twist. There's a little bit of irony in these parables. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But Jesus did that so that these truths that he would present were easily understood and easily received by the crowd. So if you notice, all three parables have the same message. The three parables say the same thing. When I was in seminary, they told us if the Bible says something once, it's very important. If the Bible repeats itself, it's really important. It's crucial. If the Bible says something three times or more, that's, that's God wanting us to get a point. So as we interpret Scripture, as we look at what he's trying to say, he's focusing on repentance. Jesus is here in this situation. We have the Pharisees and the scribes. These are the religious people of the day. The Pharisees were held in high regard by the common people that were educated. They knew how to read. They knew the law of the Old Testament. And so even though they were a minority among the Sadducees and the other groups, they kind of had the same ideas as most of the common people. They believed in angels and spirits. They believed in life after death. They believed in a resurrection. And so a lot of people held the Pharisees in high regard. But we see that the Pharisees were very judgmental. In fact, Jesus is talking about them in verse 7 when he says, when he says, just people who need no repentance. And to clarify that, it's not that they don't need repentance. They felt that they needed no repentance. They were holier than thou. They thought, as they're very judgmental here as the story starts, that they needed no repentance. They thought they had figured it out. They thought, I know the word of God. Not only did they hold to the word of God, but they held to the oral traditions that the traditions had came down from Moses. So not only did they follow the Old Testament, but they had other rules and regulations that they added on to that. And so when somebody kind of got out of, 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 of their lane, the Pharisees were very quick to point it out. In fact, look at verse 20 and 2. As the tax collectors and the sinners, the people that loved Jesus, that needed the word of Jesus for coming and listening to him, verse 2, the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners. And it's a total hypocritical church response. Someone that thinks they have it all figured out, somebody that thinks they, they are in good with God, and they're being very judgmental, looking down their nose, well, look at these people. Look at these people. They don't need to be here. They're sinners, and they're tax collectors. So the Pharisees were very judgmental. Jesus hears what they're saying, and that's why he tells these parables. He's listening to the grumblings and presenting something that they, the Pharisees, need to hear. The scribes were not religious people per se, but they were very well trained in the law of the Old Testament. We would almost equivocate them to today's attorneys and lawyers. They were almost the same way as the Pharisees. Very educated, very well respected among the crowd. So the message that Jesus presents is something that they needed to hear and something that we need to hear today as well. So in the brief time we have together, I want to call your attention to three points, three truths that I want you to see. Three truths. Please keep your Bible open as we look at repentance and what Jesus is saying. The first truth is this, ladies and gentlemen. God cares about us. I hope this comes as no surprise to you, but God cares about us. In these two stories that Jesus is talking about, the little hook, the little twist of irony in the parable is this. In the first, it is a man who has a hundred sheep, and one is, is gone, one has disappeared. And look at verse 4. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? There's the twist, there's the irony. Because you wouldn't leave ninety-nine sheep to go look for just one. Just curious, did anybody grow up on a farm? If you grew up on a farm, you have animals, right? Sometimes those animals get sick. Sometimes those animals die. Sometimes you have to get new animals because the old animals are gone. So in Jesus' day, shepherds were, were a very common thing, a very necessary occupation, but it wasn't held in very high regard. Almost anybody could be a shepherd. But no shepherd in his right mind would leave 99 sheep to go out and to look for just one. That's crazy. You wouldn't leave it in the wilderness. You would write that one off as a as, as just a, a casualty, as, as one day we can replace it. It's, it, it's a known loss. We're, we're not going to be able to, to do much with that one, but we have saved, we have retained the 99. And so Jesus is saying, what about this person who has lost one sheep and has left everyone to go and to find this? This is how important this one sheep is. Look at verse 6. 
And when he comes home after he finds it, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Rejoice. This is exciting. This is, this is an opportunity that we can be joyful for. Go on to verse 8. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. The little irony here is that money was as important in Jesus' day as it was in ours. And so if a woman has ten coins, more likely than not, they're going to be in the same place. See, they didn't have banks back then. They didn't have ATMs. It wasn't, you know, electronic debt and transfer and things like that. You had physical money. And you didn't have a lot of physical money, so you would keep your money together. And it was usually in a very safe, secured place that was secret. So the irony here is that she has lost one. How did she, how did she lose it? The Bible doesn't say it. The parable doesn't explain it. But it is important for her to ransack the home until she finds this one lost coin. And when she does, there is rejoicing. She calls her neighbors and her family to come and to spend time rejoicing and celebrating that something that was lost is found. God cares about us. He cares about you this morning here in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And I have soldiers all the time that come to the chaplain's office, you know, and they say, Sir, I, I don't think anybody loves me, or I don't think anybody cares about me, or I'm ostracized in my platoon, or, or nobody in my section talks to me, or I'm homesick, or I'm lonely, or I feel all by myself. God cares about us. There are times when we do feel lonely. There are times when, when we miss our family. There are times when we feel like, well, maybe nobody cares. But let me tell you guys, God cares about us. He cares about us very much so. He cares about us to the extent that this guy with his lost sheep and this lady with her lost coin, they, they go out until they find something that is so important to them. How much more so are we important to God? The Bible says that God cares about us. He cares about our own well-being like earthly fathers. If you have children, if you have grandchildren, you know how important they are to you. You know that you want to do everything for them to protect them and to, to guide them and to love on them. God cares about us because he's our heavenly father. He cares about our salvation. He cares about the things that are important in life, and that is very important in life. God loves sinners. There is joy when we repent. Look at verse 7. Jesus says it twice. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who feel they need no repentance. Verse 10, likewise I say to you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So God cares about us. That's point number one. Point number two, ladies and gentlemen, is this our salvation is of the utmost importance. Then our salvation is of the utmost importance. It is the most important thing about you this morning is whether or not you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ His Son. That's the most important thing about me. It's not our education. It's not our rank in the military. It's not how big our family is. It's not how good looking we are. It's not how big our house is. It's not how new our car is. Do you know Jesus Christ? Our salvation is of the utmost importance. You see, my friend, there's a day coming when we get to the other side and we stand there before God to give an account. And all these things that we think are so important in life, the possessions, the houses, the cars, the prestige, the rank, the education level, the degrees, whatever, those things do not matter. Just like when you clean someone's house out and you see the collections and the books and the clothes and the dishes and the appliances, those things are nowhere close to the importance salvation. Their salvation is of the utmost importance. And so when Jesus is telling these parables, he heard the grumbling of the Pharisees and the religious leaders. They thought they had it figured out. They thought they knew where they stood before Almighty and powerful God. But we are helpless and hopeless, like that lost sheep and like that lost boy without salvation. The greatest need that we have is for salvation because the greatest problem that we have is the problem of sin. And you see, the Pharisees, they thought they figured it out because they knew about it. They knew what the Word of God said. They had the, 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 the respect of the common crowd. But they didn't know, really, what they needed. Their salvation is of the utmost importance. That is their greatest need. Way years ago, before I got married, my brother and I, we grew up on a little farm. And we were building a plank fence. There was a sawmill about two counties over. So one Saturday morning, right early, we got the old farm truck going, and 
And we drove over to this sawmill to, to load the truck up where we could get the boards and the posts. And so we go over there, and we're, we're buying it, and we're, we're waiting for them to load it up, you know, and the forklifts and everything. And the gentleman who owned the sawmill, he came out, and he was an old man. And he had a cane, and he had some, some physical issues, but he was very friendly, very, very talkative guy. We always enjoyed talking to him. But he came out, and he was, he was slow to come out because he's on this cane, and he's talking to us, and, and, he, and we told him where we were from, and he knew some of our relatives. He said, oh, okay, so he started talking as they were loading the truck. And I can remember this like it was yesterday. He was pointing out where we were. And he said, y'all see that fence line over there? He said, yeah, that's the home place. And, and then when I was in my 20s, we bought 10 more acres on this side. And then this farm came up to sell on this other side. And he started giving us a survey of all the property, all the woods, all the possessions that he had around the saw. This guy had a lot of land. And we were just thinking, wow, that's, that's impressive. You know, you have a lot of property here in the middle of Kentucky. You know, you, you, you've done very well. And as I was driving back, I said, you know, this guy is old. And this guy's not in the greatest health. And he may have that th those things now. He might have that farm. He might have that property. He might have those woods now. But it's not going to be too much longer. Somebody else is going to have it. You see, our possessions, our property, our houses, our farms, those things, those things don't last. It's the salvation that's important. Salvation is more important than possessions. People are lost. It's not about our money or our career. Our houses, our cars, our bank accounts, our fame, our state. Knowing God in saving faith is a, the most important thing we can do. It is vital to us. Sadly, we don't think about it a lot in our day to day because we're we're overcome with all these uh, minuscule things that don't matter. But that is the most important thing. Our greatest need is salvation. Finally, thirdly, and finally, we're almost done. Repentance then is the focus. Repentance. Is the focus. Why does Jesus say the same thing in three different stories? He's talking about repentance. He's talking about sinners who need God's forgiveness. He's talking about sinners who need a relationship with God. He's talking about people that, that need to ask God to cleanse them, to forgive them. And repentance, if you don't know, is when you turn away from a sin, when you turn away from something that displeases God, you do a 180 and you go toward God and away from the sin. And so Jesus is saying repentance then needs to be our focus. You see, the Pharisees thought they had figured it out because they were religious people, but you can read religious all day long and still not know Jesus Christ. You can have the prestige of everybody around you, the organization, your community, your neighborhood, and you can still not be uh, repentant. They needed to repent. It is their greatest need. And so Jesus tells these stories to show them it's not about prestige in life. It's not about reading the Bible and, and knowing what the law says. It's about repenting because we're important to God. God cares about us. We need salvation. Repentance is the focus. So I asked a little bit earlier, what's your focus? Why are you here? And I, again, not why are you here for Brad, but just why are you here on God's earth? What is the focus for us? Well, as we close the sermon with the application, there's two things I believe. That explains what we are here for, what our focus is. First, we are here to repent and to accept Jesus Christ. That's first and foremost. And it's possible that everybody in this place this morning is a Christian and has been a Christian for years and years and years. And maybe you can say, you know, Brother Kevin, I've been a Christian so long that, that you know, I, I, you don't have to tell me that anymore. But it's also possible that there's someone here this morning who's never given their heart and their life to Jesus. If you're here this morning, I encourage you, that is the first step, to repent of your sins and to accept Jesus Christ. There is nothing more important than that. There is no greater need you have than to accept Jesus Christ and ask Him to save you. If you've already accepted Jesus and you're a Christian, you have accomplished the greatest thing in your life that you can, to know Jesus in saving faith and come through God. Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father through me. So repent and accept Jesus if you haven't done that already. And then secondly, once that's done, tell others the good news. Tell people what they need to hear. Now, I get it. It's tricky in the army. It's tricky as army chaplain sometimes, right? But that is our mission. That is what we're here for. To fulfill the great commission. To tell our neighbors, our family, our friends, our co-workers, Jesus Christ loves you. 
You're important to God. This is the greatest need you have. You're a sinner, and you need to understand that God cannot tolerate sin. But God has provided a way, the way, the truth, and the life, that through Jesus Christ, even a sinner like me can be forgiven and cleansed and can know Jesus and serve him while my life is going on. And then when I get to the other side, we'll spend eternity in heaven with God because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It's a saving nature. It's a saving mission. We need to tell others the good news. People need to hear it. What do we hear today? We hear bad news. We hear about death. We hear about war. We hear about disease. People need to hear the good news. So repent and accept Jesus if you haven't, and then tell others the good news. When I was a pastor, I used to be a pastor uh, before I joined the army. I was a pastor for 17 years and uh, did a lot of funerals in that time. And I can remember one funeral that I did. And I was there, and it was a town over. And uh, they had called me, and I didn't really know the person who had died and somebody that wasn't in church. And so they called me up. They said, Brother Kevin, would you like to come over in like a chaplain capacity just, just do the funeral service for this family? We, we know they weren't in church. They didn't belong anywhere. They don't know you. You don't know them. Would you care to do it? I said, absolutely. It'd be fine. So I went over there. And in Kentucky, the funeral homes, I don't know if this is a tradition anywhere else, but after the funeral service, Everybody lines up and they pass through the casket and they go out to get in their cars while they get the casket ready to take it to the cemetery, right? So I'm standing there and next to the casket, the funeral director is there. And they're playing the organ music and all these folks are coming out and they're looking at the, the person in the casket one last time. And then they go out to get in their cars. And as everybody had gone out of that funeral home except for one young man, he was the son, or one of the sons of the, of the uh, fellow that had passed away. And it was just me and the funeral home director and this young man. And everybody else was out, and he asked the funeral director, he said, I wonder if it's okay if we put this hat on Dad. And he had this sack, and he brought out this University of Kentucky Wildcats baseball. So from Kentucky, there's no professional sports. We have no professional baseball, no professional basketball, no professional football, but you better like college basketball if you're in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And it's almost a rule you better like the University of Kentucky. I'm a rebel because I like the rules. Everybody else, everybody else, you will be a Wildcat fan or you will be ostracized, right? But I want to tell the point of this is that this man, after his dad was gone in the castle, he it meant something for him to want to put this Wildcat baseball cap on his dad. And he had it there. And the funeral director said, yeah, that would be fine. And I swear, guys, I've never seen anything like this. They, that the man had been dead a while. He was no person anyway, but he, he'd been dead a while. And the, the corpse was so rigid that they were trying to get the, the body out of the casket to put this brand new baseball cap, and it was still stiff. I mean, you know, it still had the tags on it and everything. And it was important for that man to put this hat on this corpse of his father. And I stood there, my heart just broke. This person wasn't in church that I knew of, and I didn't know, they didn't even say if he knew Jesus Christ. But I'm thinking, you know, the greatest need that he had, the greatest thing he could have done was to know Jesus Christ. It would have been a totally different funeral. And here at the end, after the body's cold and stiff, and this man's trying to get some solace, trying to get some comfort in putting a hat over something that means nothing on this corpse, it just broke my heart. Let me encourage you. If you know Jesus Christ this morning, praise the Lord. That is the greatest thing you can do. It broke my heart to see somebody who had no hope, who had no future, who had no promise to try to, try to put a cheap baseball hat on someone who's already too bad. Salvation is far more important than sports teams. It's far more important than anything else. Do you know Jesus Christ? Why are you here to know Jesus? Tell others about it. Pray with me. Holy and perfect Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your peace, your love, your comfort, your strength, your power. Father, we thank you that even though we are sinners, and God, you know our hearts and our minds, and you know our actions, and you know all the things that we've done wrong in our lives. But Father God, because you are concerned about us, we're like those lost sheep and those lost coins to you. Father, you have such a great love and concern for us that you want the best for us. Father, we thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. And we 
don't come to you except for him. And Father, we thank you for who you are. And Father, I pray for this congregation this morning. And Father, and I'm sure that, that most of us are Christians and we've been believers for years and years and years. Father God, I pray that if there's even one here today who has not yet made that important decision to accept Christ, that they come to know Jesus while there's an opportunity. And Father, the Bible says in 1 John 1 9, if we're quick to confess, you're quick to forgive. And so, Father, we confess and repent and ask you to forgive us of all the sins that we commit, Father. You are a holy God, you're a just God, and Father, we are, we're fallen. And sometimes we do the wrong thing. So, Father, we pray for forgiveness. Lord, I also pray for our family and our friends and the people that aren't here to, today in May Post Chapel. Father, those that need to hear the gospel as well. And Father, I pray that you would be, help us to be salt and light as we go out to see you. That others will see Jesus through our actions. That they'll see how we conduct ourselves. That they'll see that we are changed, that we are our believers. And Father, I pray that you would use that as, as testimonies and witnesses to those of you. Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for Christ Jesus who died in our place. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin. Father, thank you for this opportunity that we could worship you today in spirit and in truth. Thank you for your word. Father, help us to live out this message over the next week. We give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' holy and powerful name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, our hymn of invitation this morning is Cleveland 343. Amazing Grace 343. Stand and sing. Amazing Grace. First verse.